Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'm ready for today's show. I saw you had a lot of links out there, so I'm excited to see where we're going to take it, where it's going to go. Yeah, I was I was actually going through that intro, you know, talking about, you know, all the all the stuff we got coming up, you know, both both here just in this episode and kind of in our our broader ecosystem. I've been recording the integration sessions uh to put on YouTube. So I've been going through a lot of scripts and uh and and reading off that intro. Um I know one of your feedbacks that you had for me was you know the the the, the different tone of voice I have when I'm when I'm reading something versus when presenting, we're presenting yeah yeah presenting oh, or oh, you know yeah. having that yeah so I I'm I'm now acutely aware of that and have been like going through and and plus I've just been recording a lot so like I've been reading off these different scripts and stuff and and we've got uh, how many do we have coming down the pipe for the for the promos that we got seven or eight i want to okay. say okay i think we have seven or eight yeah yeah we got a decent amount so that'll be that'll be once again just a lot more recording i'm not going to be doing all of it you get you got a couple there half and half yeah yeah so we'll see how that goes um but yeah no i'm i'm very happy with the the content that we're putting out um i i i love doing this right i i really do as much as i didn't think i would like video editing that's kind of become like my new favorite thing to do um it's just it's it's a lot of fun you know piecing stuff together and and just doing little things here and there and it it is you know time consuming but yesterday i think i put together the entire integration session in something like six hours okay so what just in an evening just after actually like putting the whole thing together all right i'm I'm turning through this i'm getting through it yep yep from uh from script oh. to upload oh, that's yeah. awesome yeah yeah that's so awesome. i was i'm very happy doing that uh and and obviously there's no shortage of information i mean yeah i've just been seriously pouring in the the links and stuff and and stuff is coming fast and furious and uh most of it's good so so great to see that and uh I, I got a couple things in the intro that that grabbed my eye this these these last two weeks. Uh, most recently, the the one about night owls may be twice as likely as early risers to underperform at work, and uh, I was I I think as intended outraged, absolutely outraged. I felt the same way because I'm a night I'm I feel like I stay up later than most. I just kind of put myself in that category. I'll probably go to bed around midnight. So I, I, I believe the four types that they were talking about was like early morning risers, um, kind of like middle of the day, evening types, and then other. I think they're just trying to categorize into those four uh, sections. And they, they actually said uh, 10%. Uh, of the men and 12% of the women were classified as evening types. Um, now that this was almost 6,000 people and this is in Northern Finland, which is weird because like, that's a very Northern country in that, like there's a very distinct lack of sunlight during a lot of those months, which I'm sure affects, you know, a, a, a lot of this. Um, but they didn't go into much of that. They, tried to keep it uh, as I understood it to productivity and self-reported productivity so what were you I mean did you see anything in here because I, I I got a couple ideas but I just want to it's all the um, they did mention that you know maybe the evening person the one this is the one thing that kind of stuck with me uh, as I kind of look at the article now kind of remember it that the evening person is more likely to stay and get the work done you know and hit the due date yeah, I, I like that take on it. This wasn't from the study itself. It was from a conversation on the the study by a Suzanne Hood, uh, an associate professor at Bishop's University in Canada. So different different uh, country entirely, same kind of northern I- idea there, but like completely different country, completely different culture. And what I saw from her takeaways was a lot of yes, but 
right? In, instead of and accept, right? So there's there was a bunch of, yes, the employee who seems like a slow starter in the morning might be the person uh, who's most able to work effectively into the evening to meet an important deadline, I think is what you were quoting there. Um, or, you know, if there's opportunity for flexibility in scheduling, right? Maybe someone who's more willing to work, you know, either either later hours or not come in as early in order to cover and be active during those later parts of the day where a lot of people would be like antsy to go like walk their dogs or get get out, go for a walk, know, stretch. Great. Yeah, exactly. Do something else at that point. I mean it's eight hour day is a long day. It's a very long day. And and I can't honestly say I've I've met a whole lot of people who can just work straight through it. Uh, on a consistent basis like there's people sure who who will but a lot of that needs to be broken up and and meetings do afford a lot of that and and we're going to be talking about meetings today that's that's going to be a fun discussion i'm excited about that um but but meetings help to br- break that up you know from from someone who's a typical you know if you're an office worker if you're more introverted versus a someone who's who's on the job all day yeah you're you are called to work that eight hours you know during during the end of the day you know if 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 people are are ready to go when other people are ready to to kind of back off the gas like that just to me seems like a healthy balance um and and i as well would would kind of categorize uh myself as as more of a early afternoon, you know, uh, late evening person, I, I'd say probably my most productive hours would be between like one thirty and 1130. Uh, after that, okay. if I'm like, if I'm like really invested in something, I know you've gotten messages from me at like one thirty in the morning, yep. two totally. o'clock, two fifteen. Totally. I'm like, yeah, I just finished this. I'm off to bed. <laughs> my next takeaway from the article, Suzanne hood points out that due to differences in readiness to fall asleep, the evening person arriving at the office at eight may have only had six hours of sleep, whereas a morning person arriving at the same time had eight hours. And that is directly correlated to when you go to sleep based yeah. on how you how productive you are in the evening. So it's it's not even that there's like the same conditions, the same sleep conditions will, will produce the same productivity. It's that literally someone is sleep deprived and you're comparing them to someone who's not. Walking in, hey, do you think you're productive today? Dude, I just slept five hours. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, no. So, so yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it summed up very nice at the bottom of the article. And, th- and this is why I posted it and, and didn't just let myself get outraged by the headline. Because I think okay. it came to a great conclusion. I mean, the advice here uh, at the end is that, you know, quote, I'd encourage people whose work schedule is out of sync with their chronotype, the genetics Sleep you were talking schedule, about. Yeah. yeah to try to follow a regular sleep schedule to avoid becoming sleep deprived. Uh, and she said, you know, chronotypes are, are malleable, so we can shift our preferred times a day around a little by keeping a daily routine of sleeping and waking times. And, you know, what's the age old advice, you know, go to sleep at the same time every day. Yeah, and that segues right into our next article because there's many ways that you can fatigue yourself at your computer, not just physically, you know, not just physically in your eyes, but like there's a lot of emotional fatigue that you can experience just through your day to day interactions, especially after working from home. And, you know, one one of the things we have here, one of the things we have here is Zoom fatigue. Um, and I am super excited to talk about this. So did you did you take a look at the four reasons that they pointed out here? Mm-hmm. And and what were your thoughts on those? That makes sense. Sitting up really close to your screen. Uh, the uh, seeing yourself, that's always a weird one. Reducing mobility, fine. I, I thought that was kind of a sham because usually when I sit in a meeting anyway, I'm sitting, I'm sitting in a chair. And then uh, the cognitive load, I don't know how that one kind of factored in, but the first two definitely made the most sense which was um, excessive amounts of close-up eye contact and then seeing yourself during video chats. I think that's just a hurdle you have to kind of get over. Well, that one that one specifically for me was, was weird uh, because if you think about a generation that's been raised on selfies and video chats, that is almost second nature. You, know, you, you, you are staring at yourself multiple times a day for prolonged amounts of time. Even when you and I have been talking on video chats 
for the past two years or, or whatever it's been. Yeah. yeah. That's been something we've continuously done over over video. And I've I've told you even that I actually typically tend to stare at myself as we're talking. Right. You know? Sure. It's something that intrigues me. It's just that's naturally where I'm I'm double checking myself. I'm making sure like I sure, I right? look all right. You know, am I am I going crazy? Uh, and and it's weird because sociologically and and they they say it here as as far as uh, the cognitive load thing. Each of us naturally makes and interprets gestures and nonverbal cues subconsciously. That's very very hard to do over Zoom. And as well, when I'm in a meeting with other people, I'm looking at them to confirm okay. that I'm not going crazy. Like if they all start staring at me and looking at me and like get really stiff or like concerned or, or crouched over, like I can infer from that that I'm like posing a threat or they're angry or they're confused or, you know, so, something like that. Whereas in a in a video chat we we have nothing of that. Here up, you see from like here up, shoulders up, basically. Yeah. So literally, you have you have shrug, you have smile, you have nod, wave, and thumbs up, and and that's that's one of the things during the the pandemic that I've realized, especially when all the the mass mandates kind of came into force, where in order to make a connection. You couldn't just like read someone's facial expressions or or even read their lips because oddly enough, where the human eye focuses on on faces while you're talking, the three places that will not look out of whack if you focus on them is the eyes, the forehead, and the mouth. So you can focus on any three of those places. You yeah. can focus on any three of those places and and be a normal human. Right? Masks take away one third of those options for oh, you. Okay. Sure. Right. All right. So I now, now you only have those, those two things in order to get across, you know, the, the emphasis and, and the emotion behind the words that you're saying. So video chat. And well, here's the thing though, in person, you still have your body in video chat. You don't even have that, right? You, you know, it, you can kind of tell I'm, I'm uh, hunched up or, you know, relaxed or, you know, if I have a really, you know, proud, you know, puffed up chest or something like that, it can kind of come across. Uh, but something that's helped me both in, in the zoom world and in the post mask mandate world is hand gestures. A lot of them zoom comes with its own, similar challenges right we have to we have to choose our words a lot more carefully now and we have to kind of keep thinking about that on top of how we are presenting ourselves so that that i believe that cognitive load is real but i believe that feeds in a lot to their third point which was the video chats reducing our usual mobility right and and just to recap i mean this is this is uh, a study that identified four consequences of prolonged video chats right so what these these four reasons are are the you know kind of the symptoms not the not the symptoms but the, like the the causes of of why it why it stresses us out so much it was there was there was a meme and i wanted to i wanted to post it i didn't grab it there was a meme someone was like uh at their desk and they they hit something on their computer they're like all right yeah let's uh let's get this meeting started and then they swivel to their phone and it's like two hours later and they're like all right guys good talking to you bye oh you click and the dude hangs up he's like man i'm exhausted <laughs> looking at his phone or whatever well and, and, but that's that's not even it i mean you, sure you're looking at your phone but if you have someone who's like enforcing that your video needs to be on or not even enforcing but like it's a norm or you know you're expected yeah. to you at least have to listen and see all the other people's faces staring back at you which is looking i think the the most important reason here and that's why they put it as number one yeah right i i, I think they make a really good point here in that excessive amounts of close-up eye contact is highly intense. Th that is great wording on their part because it it's not like it's always confrontational. It's not like it's always... What do I want to say? Uh, it, it can trigger a lot of 
social anxiety. It, actually, social anxiety, they say here, uh, of public speaking is one of the biggest phobias that exist in our population. Like, that's that's been a trope for decades, you know, getting up in front of an audience and, and going to speak. And now we expect everyone to do it naturally in, you know, groups of 20 to 30 people. Like, is that is, do you think that's something that just comes naturally to everyone? Because it's it's not. I will I will promise you that it's not. What really hits is that when someone's face is that close to ours in real life, and I'm quoting from the article yeah. here, our brains interpret it as an intense situation that's either going to lead to mating or to conflict. What's okay. happening, quote, in effect, when you're using Zoom for many, many hours is that you're in this hyper aroused state where you're you're sensitive about everything. And if, you know, I, work is obviously stressful as it is, right? Making, putting you into that hyper stressed out state, just, you know, in, instead of being in a regular Enterprise, meeting, yeah. which is, which is annoying enough as it is being in this this hyper stressed out intense kind of state all the time uh can lead to fatigue because you your your brain is on overdrive the entire time it's like what what is he thinking why is he staring at me so much what's going on what's going to happen you know what's what's going to come of this and and your brain's going a mile a minute and you sustain that over the course of you know a regular eight hour work day you have you know two or three hours of meetings a day yeah that's a lot that is a lot this dude who's really close to me is speaking directly to me and that's the fourth time this happened today what's going on you know your brain's screaming at you what's going on and and you have to rein it in and say well okay this is that I hated the phrase new normal for a long time for many reasons. But this is the new normal. I mean, people are needing to have their brains trained to not freak out over stuff like that. Now, that's simply a consequence of, of where we're at right now. I'm not going to comment on whether I like that or not. Because uh, I, I, I think it's a very complex issue. But regardless of, of what needs to be done or not done about it, it is happening. And... It behooves us to be aware of it so that we can be conscientious of it to address it as we need to. So do you have a lot of Zoom meetings at work? I do. Yeah. And it's Microsoft Teams, but it's, so that's what we have as it's well. It's video. Yeah. And is, so here's my second question. Is a lot of your team all at the same uh, workplace or do you have a lot of people at remote sites or because like I'm the only person on my on my sub team at our region. I'm the only person there. So like we'll have meetings and it's just them. And most of the people I work with are in a different city. So a lot since I've been, since I started even it's been, you know, teams meetings, it's been dialing and it, it pretty much the same as kind of held true with dialing just because we have, we, they do the conference line. So we just, I just call on the conference line and it's just, you know, someone, if someone needs to present, they will, but usually it's just, it's been dialing since I started just to deal with everyone across regions just to accommodate for everybody. So do you think it's, do you think the normal has changed? Do you think it's become more acceptable to embrace like newer technology? Cause I, you, you're talking about dialing in. I mean, a lot of people did simply dial in to, to conference calls before this became normalized. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we're not there. It is a push forward with technology. It's definitely different. I, I generally think most people like to join the Zooms with the camera off. You know, if a lot of people are doing it, they'll turn them on. But for us, at least it's not a, an absolute mandate. I don't know if it is for you guys or if it's the norm for you guys to do it. No. And, and obviously this isn't new either. I mean, right. for one, Twitch has been around for years, right? The difference between that and a meeting is that Twitch I view as a performance medium, right? That you're, right. you're exactly. on there to give a performance, exactly. right? Exactly. It's not an interaction. It's not a meeting. It's not, you know, a chat between peers. It's a performance of one person interacting with a group audience. It's, audience, right. Yeah. It's a, it's a presentation. It's a, you know, you're, you're on, you're, you're in, in the limelight. Whereas something like this, first of all, it's weird to have everyone on the stage. That just does, doesn't work. 
Well, we can't fit everyone on the stage right now, right? <laughs> can't do that. But we're we're now forced to. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's weird, and it's something I've wanted to dive into a while. And I think this is this is the closest that really hit home. And I said, yes, I can see these underlying cause and effects kind of hitting home uh, as as we get further and further into this. What I was going to say is, I think it was always there. But I think with what happened last year with COVID and everything, it just kind of hyper intensified. Like, I think it kind of brought us there a lot quicker. I think the technology brought us to this state where you are now just a lot, a lot quicker rather than progressing over. All right. You know, in five years, Zoom's going to be big or whatever. It's like, all right, well, everyone has to. Hey, guess what? Everyone has to work from home right now. And this is the technology we're using. You have you basically you have to use it. Right. And and it brought us through quicker because it wasn't simply jobs that adopted this it's families adopted this to see one another Uh, churches small groups adopted this to maintain interactions yeah D &D clubs hopped on twitch or you know did whatever they had to 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 continue that i mean people are now exposed to this a lot more than they were even if their job was already if, even if that was already normalized in their in their job, now it's become normalized in the rest of their life. Right. And they're dealing with this outside of work. They're dealing with this all day, everywhere. So I I, I definitely want to keep all of this in the back of my head. Uh, I don't think there was a real kind of piece of a, a, a advice. I mean, there there were a couple of solutions at the the end. I, I I think I think uh, a lot of a lot of what they have here is a lot of just hey take a break from it uh, be a little bit normal for for a time and and then come back to it you don't always have to be like hyper into Zoom like uh, a, a lot of these under each of the points here is a s- solution quote unquote so uh, a lot of these just say give yourself a break of one kind or another that could be going outside that could be exercising. That could be just looking away from your monitor. We got a lot of news and community updates today. Uh, so I'm just going to dive right in there, starting with Bitwarden. So Bitwarden 1.19 was released, uh, which means soon we're going to be updating our instances to 1.18. Uh, there was a couple things about admin interfaces here. Um, the ability to modify a user's type in an organization and to delete the whole organization. So we're definitely giving administrators more power here to control organizations. And when we get to Bitwarden, we'll go over how that's all structured and how it you know interconnects and and stuff like that. But I'm um, I'm happy to see that they're adding more things to the the admins tool chain. Uh, and they also introduced basic experimental support for LDAP. So that's very cool. That's nice. very cool. So we'll we'll see how that that gets on. There's a lot of caveats there. I'm not going to be taking advantage of that anytime soon, but it is interesting to see that they're leaning towards that direction. I mean, come on, any kind of sizable entity is going to have an identity management system already. You're going to want to be able to tie into something because chances are, if you can tie into something, the something else that they're using can imitate that something that you can tie into. And with a bunch of kludgy, hacky scripts, you can get it to work. You can get there, right? It always takes, whenever I see a Bitwarden release for the Rust version, which this is, I always think, why couldn't Bitwarden themselves, the actual organization, make something this slim down? I think you, I think it's five containers in total between. And it's like a MySQL container? A database server or like a cache server, an app server. It's a lot. Front end server. It's like, whoa, 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 hang on, pump the brakes. Like we don't, (laughs) we do not need this. For this now that is if i'm not mistaken though what they host themselves so my assumption would be that that performs at scale and right right that's probably why they have it now the argument against that though is that rust is way more performant than c sharp so wouldn't that work better i don't know i i really don't and if you look in the back end of what it actually does which unfortunately i had to do it's not doing a whole lot more than simply serving you JavaScript in order for your browser to make all the necessary computations to reach in and have put requests and get requests that is 
to to a service that is simply holding that data for you and everything's encrypted like the entire everything's encrypted so like there's no actual functionality that takes place on the back end it's all basically the javascript on the front end now some of the admin permissions and, and stuff that that you can and cannot go in and delete and access i'm sure that's on the back end too but a lot of it is just remedial data storage it's it's in essence very simple which is why i think this has been able to be developed so so close to the actual product itself um no i'm i'm very happy that it has been though because it's been such a boon to be able to have that uh as a password manager yeah it changed the way i manage passwords once i started using it um i had keypass out there and that at keypass xc and that was just a bit of an it, it wasn't bad to manage but it was just hard to manage across devices and i was scared i was honestly scared to put my passwords i guess quote unquote online and expose but Knock on wood, it hasn't been a problem, right? My master key is fine. I rotate it, you know, once a quarter, once every half year. So, sure. Now, what led them to be able to do that? I'm not sure if you're aware, but there was a precursor program called Bitwarden RB, which was a Ruby implementation of it. Uh, that's actually where a lot of the reverse engineering happened uh, back in the day. Was was in order to get to that point where you could feasibly host that Bitwarden RB instance. And they had one, one of the most valuable things, and it's still in the repo, is a design document about the architecture of Bitwarden that? and like the yeah. API promises and, and all that, which is why when Firefox, it's Firefox, why when Firefly 3 came out with their architecture documentation, I was through the roof. Like this was this was really really cool. Um, so the the next article obviously uh, is is a link to that where they go through and detail out all of the internals that you could need to know in order to get started. Talking about the the helpers, their generators, their models and views, uh, controllers. So uh, all that, all that information is, is in there for how this works. And it is a classic PHP application, right? So it's, it's, it's very kind of simple as, as to how it lays out, how it is laid out and, and how it functions. Uh, but just the dumping that, dumping that mental model is always difficult because it's something that you're, you're holding and, as you're working through problems, you're focusing in on different segments and um, really only only if you are able to hold all of those little segments in your head are you able to start architecting for, for something to fit within that broader scope. And putting that on paper is very, very difficult. So I am, yeah, and, and there's not a lot of, not a lot of benefit to doing it right other than a a a big heaping of goodwill uh and and hopefully some insight for potential developers or uh, anyone who wants to come along and and improve uh what's going on in in order just to have that spelled out and and available so it, it it like I said, it takes a lot to do this, and there's just not a whole lot of, of kickback that he's going to get because of this. So, you know, my you know, my, my 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 thanks to uh, James here uh, for, for putting that out. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up, uh, we have NextCloud Hub. NextCloud Hub actually released a post-announcement Q&A on YouTube after they... They streamed their their virtual 2021 Nextcloud conference presentation, um, talking about you know some of their some of their highlights. Um, two things I took out of this article: uh, they have a high performance Nextcloud files high performance backend, yep. which is looks really cool to me. Um, it's actually a Rust binary uh, that powers this, so so written in Rust. And it's, it's something that interacts between clients and the Nextcloud storage itself to cut down the 
client server connections by 90%, which is ridiculous. That's a lot. Ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Whether you're in a browser, whether you're using the, the desktop integration, whether you're on mobile, you're cutting down 90% of the traffic that you need to, to sync across that, the, the network. That is amazing. That is amazing. So I got to look more into how this works per se. And if it's something that we could potentially implement uh, on our services, because that would, that would be great to have that. And Rust obviously known for being very lightweight and memory lightweight and uh, very resource constrained. Like this, this should fit perfectly into what we're doing here. Um, so I'm very, very happy to see that. Uh, and the other thing, did you did you get a chance to take a little look at the new whiteboard that they're including here? I haven't used it yet. I saw what they have out there though, similar to Draw I O. I don't know if you've seen that or used that before, but that's what it reminded me of. I've done both. Yeah. Yeah. But no, what do you think of the uh, whiteboard that they have? Well, I having it a whiteboard. Having a whiteboard is great. I'll tell you what my my most successful meetings ever have come. Well, okay, let me let me take that back. My most successful design and architecture meetings have come when I'm literally standing in front of a whiteboard for like 30 minutes and writing down everything everyone has to say. There's many reasons for this. Foremost, I think, because it visually represents the fact that you're listening to their contributions and you're valuing their contributions. Sure. Especially right. if you write down everything they say, because as soon as you say something to the contrary, or as soon as you negate something that they say, the instinct is to completely shut down, you know, right. oh, that, you know, he didn't, he didn't like anything I had to say. Right. Well, right. no, I, I literally took the last 20 minutes of what you've been saying. And I want to make sure Noted that what that. you just said jives up with everything else that you have been saying for the past 20 minutes so that I can understand you better. Right. So that, that, that creates a whole lot of goodwill when you're able to, to do that. And, and talking about zoom fatigue i mean you you don't really have a, a a way to do that virtually there's there's no good way White. to whiteboard out right so this is this is at least a step in the good direction um uh, you know especially if you're you're able to present you know something similar to this would be like their mind map feature you could probably also use uh in in order to to do that but the ability to have a whiteboard is is something that i've missed i have i have definitely missed being able to sit down and like just just hash something out with someone in in the room and and just go through an entire rationale it looked like a couple updates to some of the other applications that they have in nextcloud just smaller features that look like they were added just to kind of match you know what what else is out there so i saw i think you're able to raise your hand and talk i haven't i think i've used talk once just as a proof of concept just to see oh hey this doesn't work but past that i haven't used it so that that was kind of the other feature i saw but no nothing nothing else stuck out to me besides those two big ones they do have a link in the article to the video that kind of goes through and explains how this is all supposed to work and the throughput and yada 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 um so that's something i should be looking into now this could be something that would work with our bind map points where we would go like directly through nginx but that would be that would be if we use the php fpm backend of nextcloud which is the lightweight version which doesn't have like apache in front of it i don't know if we would able be able to proxy that using the subdirectory the only problem is can we proxy that to a subdirectory and if we can then that's something that we can look into um we might get into some kind of optimization in Q2. We don't necessarily have room for that in Q1, but I do have it actually in the backlog to see if we could set something like that up for Nextcloud. Because I know Nextcloud is one of our bigger performance uh, hogging services. Uh, Rundack being the number one because it's just, it's Java. What are you going to do? At least Nextcloud is PHP. Uh, but it, you know, it's something that we can look into and, and see see if we can't make it a little bit more lean. 
And as everyone who is looked into our Compose knows, we run all of this on digital ocean droplets. So we use we use one droplet as, as our back end and, and they're pretty fast, you know, in, in themselves. They've they've been very reliable and I've been I've been super happy with them. We haven't seen any kind of resource issues. And if we have, it's really just, you know, kind of us not provisioning large enough for what we need. You know, we've under provisioned for us under provision resources for ourselves. You know, we're on it we are running run deck. We're running basic. We're running all the services on a, a droplet. Of course, it's going to take some memory, right? <laughs> we have a lot of swap. A lot of swap. <laughs> Actually, it'd be it'd be it'd be interesting to look up if if we started using uh, SSD based or like if they have any M.2 based VMs and we could put swap on that. That would be blazing fast. That would basically give us free RAM. But anyways, without diving into that. Uh, did you see the article about Digital Ocean uh, getting ready to go public? I did see that they posted their numbers for I think it was uh, 2020 and 2019. It was around 200 million dollars in revenue in 2018, 254 in 2019, and 318 in 2020. That's insane to me. That's absolutely crazy. I didn't know they were that. I I knew they were big. I did not know that they were 300 million dollars big. So and and. Because you think of it as yeah, you think of it as like this small like developer platform. Like oh hey, we're using this for this because a lot of the features they have are just like hey, you're an admin now on this. Like that's kind of the granularity on it. They don't really have you know user like the user access is kind of all or none. And I guess they're doing well. I mean, three hundred twenty million. Well, they have they have a lot of feature parity, and not only is that feature parity usable uh, with the bigger cloud providers, but it's also way better laid out. Like the UI and the 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 experience of just figuring out what to do on DigitalOcean is great. Plus, obviously, it's easy to use and it's easy to consume. Yeah, you can walk up and you can go, okay, I want you know one virtual CPU or one CPU. And I want, you know, a gig of RAM. All right. You go through the steps and it's, where do you want this? What do you want it to be named? Do you want it? How big do you want the disk size? And it's pretty much holding your hand, walking you through like, hey, this this is the server you want. This is the server you want. And then you deploy it and you're off. Versus, I know I had AWS out there for a little bit and it wasn't a nightmare, but it's just, there's a learning curve. There's a steep, a steeper learning curve. I feel like DigitalOcean is pretty good. Just you know, here's the ramp, jump off, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, and and a lot of the services nowadays are pitched as. I mean, go back to the episode we were talking about last pass. You know, uh, last episode or two episodes ago, where they locked their free tier into a a you know one thing or another. Right, one uh, one platform or another. Either you're a desktop user or you're a mobile user, and we were talking about why are they able to do that? Like, why why are they doing that? Why are they offering this free tier service? Well, it, it it's it's because their free tier is meant to get people in so that they can walk people through it and and onboard them as quickly as possible. Right, once. Once you're able to onboard somebody and they're able to make that determination for themselves because you want to put them in the best situation where they can make a value determination for themselves, right? It doesn't matter if you've pre-framed it to the best of your ability, if you know your, your, your marketing and your skills, skills are, are on point, right? The only way that they're going to make that decision is if they see the value that they're getting from actually using the product. And the quicker you can get someone to that point, and and sometimes you could do it through sales, but a lot of times, you know, in in this gig economy, people are expecting to evaluate the product before buying it. They they want that kind of trial right. period, and DigitalOcean offers that. I mean, a lot of them, a lot of a lot of DigitalOcean advertisements on some of the podcasts I I listen to are you know. Hundred dollars free for sixty days, right? Let's just get you on and, and get you going there, and they prove it out 
by their user experience after they they've gotten you to 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 sign up for for that promo they're like hey now we can really show you where the value is going to come from whereas in aws they're they've kind of taken a tactical we're we're the first and the greatest so deal with us yeah then what they do offer the uh 12 month free i think for a certain it's like you get a certain for credit for 12 months but the the onboarding is just yeah you really have to be kind of an ex you kind of have to walk in already knowing what you're doing with it versus DigitalOcean. it's simple and that's what people want they just want it simple they want it you know i want to be able to deploy a server i want it deployed now and i want a public ip on it i don't want to have to worry about creating a you know security firewall groups or you know navigating nat or whatever to between addresses or what i don't need a virtual cloud i need one so you know I need maybe a handful of servers, need them public. And I mean, I think that's kind of where they, they've sold me on easeability. It's just easy. It, it's easy. Yeah. And if you're, if you're looking to lift and shift into the cloud with, you know, your network segmentation and your network based firewalls and your centralized identity subnets, right. And just, just like all the things that legacy infrastructure expects, uh, then, you know, they, they can provide that. But that's something that AWS is, is more kind of up your alley because that's going to be over-architectured and it, it's it's going to be a lot lot more comprehensive than, than what DigitalOcean has. DigitalOcean's value proposition, and I don't actually know it, but it seems to me that their ver- value proposition is to say, we are ready to get you up and running in the blink of an eye. Not only that, but like offer you these services that are super easy to consume, like the extensible storage and the backups and the snapshots and the uh, floating IPs that we use. Like a, a lot of what we do wouldn't be able to be done without a lot of that functionality. And and I just think that you know the only th- the only thing they don't have, which ticks me off, is that they don't have uh, managed NFS service, but that's neither here nor there. If if I could get that, then I would be I would be happy. But I was looking at like you know at GCP and and uh, AWS and what was the other one I was looking at? Uh, actually, there were some third parties that provided it where they said, yeah, we'll we'll provision you know NFS mounts and you can mount them on servers and whatever. Um, it was an exorbitant amount of money to do that i was gonna say how much was that a small fortune yeah yeah per month it was a small it was a small fortune per month so you know, at, at, at some point they've not only said is this technically possible and they've not only said is it popular among people who would use it right but they said is it within is it reasonable you know to to offer this solution that may be price prohibitive for a lot of people who are using our service just to get their stuff into the cloud and the answer is probably going to be no as frustrated as that makes me uh, but I, I I can only say that look they've they've done their due diligence and more power to them uh, so I, I hope they've done that for their IPO as well obviously we talked uh, at length in in an earlier episode about going public um so we'll see i'll 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 be keeping close tabs on this so we'll we'll see where they go with this and how this pans out for them yeah i think that wraps it up for news was that the last news item you had that's the last news item um i have uh just rounding out our can board discussions uh we we did want to make sure we hit all of our bases and filled out all of the documentation that is is promised in our sidebar here so uh jack i saw that you filled out the uh the search documentation which is you know fairly uh simple but it's out there i mean what canboard has on their official documentation site is pretty good that's kind of i went along the same roads i added in a few customizations of hey this is how we you know this is what we use. This is how we search. Yep. Uh, so, so that actually does officially wrap up our can board track, and we are going to start our next cloud track. 
Uh, so, Jack, with the track. I first put in uh, a lot on Nextcloud Hub, and uh, I didn't know where to go with it. So I actually added a few subheaders in, and um, I think I'm just going to kind of spitball here because there is a lot going on in Nextcloud. I will tell you that. Well, okay. So so how would you how would you start on a brand new Nextcloud install? Where where would be the place for you personally to start? So the first thing I always do is apps. I, I love adding in my apps. Of course, you can go settings um, just to configure and make sure all your volume amounts are right. Um, honestly, for settings at least, I would make sure you're, vo- you're mounted to the right volume. So I think it's in, let's see here. Yeah, settings and then all the way at the bottom on the very left. I, I'm, uh, well, I'll save most of this for in- the integration discussion, but in system in the system settings at the very bottom of settings you could basically make sure you're mounted to the right spot which at our compose we already have it mounted for you correctly but if you're getting it set up on your own always worth checking out also in that system page it does show you you know usage and uptime and everything else you might want to see about how your instance is running that's a lot about the administration uh if i were if i had just been handed an instance i'd say all right who's this for what users do I have on here? Who are my users? Who are my admins? Who's my who are my group users? Who are my and who are my end users? Basically, just to make sure I can get them set up. Well, why do, why why does that matter? I guess. So, you need to be able to share files, right? That that's for me at least. I use mine with my family, uh, contacts, calendar, and um, file storage. I. The main, you know, the main main use, like, hey, I found this audiobook, check it out. What I usually do is, for myself at least, I'll go in, I'll add the file, I'll create a public folder. So I have the public folder, and I'll just say, hey, it's out there, check it out. Everything under this folder is going to be shared. I don't have to worry about it. I can just say, hey, new link out, check it out, share it. I know in Nextcloud you can choose on a per item basis what you want to share. And you can choose how you want to share, and you can be pretty granular about how you share it, who's able to edit it, read write permissions and everything, and you can get notifications on edits. It it it's very feature complete. Like it's it's kind of exactly what you'd want for sharing files. But I always make mine read only in my environment. Um, obviously, if you're in a business environment or you're very cl- highly collaborative environment, it's going to be a lot different. But I always create that public folder and just switch the settings for it to public after that if i need users i need i I know like you and i both have accounts on there so it's not open to the world per se so we have that out there when we have our file structure set up i guess is where i'd go first or second i should say making sure you got to have the users before you set up the the folders right are you yeah, because because you, you you started out saying that you you shared your public folder with your users. So yeah, haven't haven't gone over the users. I mean, do you you, you obviously don't throw just everything in the public, but like no, you... God, no, goodness, no, goodness, no, <laughs> <laughs> like public doc. No, right? <laughs> you don't share. <laughs> you don't... Oh no, yeah. Wait, well, why shouldn't I put everything in public? <laughs> well, not only that, but we have a very specific setup with different permissions that we use for the compositional enterprise instance. Yeah. You'd have to, do you want to dive into that a little bit? I can't. For how those are shared. Yeah. Because I, I know the, the media and the content goes out there and I know it was my under, I was under the impression that the Jekyll site pulled from the next cloud site and then the MP4 is from the next cloud instance. And I know we have the photos up there as well. So I just assumed it was all pulled from there. Now, how that automatically happens, I think you're going to have to dive into. Yeah, that's that's my my own little magic in the background happening there, which is, is, is very fun to, to set up. But so we, we actually, uh, on, the, on the instance we share for this, we have a couple things set up. We have, uh, pr- first of all, we have our own personal files and folders like I, I keep some stuff in my own personal documents folder for you stuff I'm working on uh, currently yeah yeah so that's that's just sitting there that's doing its thing uh, and then 
a lot of what I have in my what would what would amount to my home directory here uh, is is shared between the two of us. And that's an interesting concept too to, to think about it as a home directory because if we think of if we got a brand new computer and we had a directory, you're probably going to have some folders pre-existing in that directory. I don't know where this idea came about, but you're always going to have like a videos directory and a photos directory and like a my documents directory and a downloads directory. So I, I, I kind of treat this as something like that. I tend to to mentally configure it like that in, in my head. Uh, the things that I end up sharing with you, however, are typically things that I, I don't nest within those other directories. If, if it's worth it for us to share it, uh, then I just share it out of my home directory. Now, as you share, like if I were to share a brand new directory with you, it would actually pop up in your home directory. Now it's up to you if you wanted to move it somewhere else and, and you could re-architecture it. And uh, you know, part of, part of it, part of me leaving it here may just be because I'm lazy and don't feel like moving around, but they're there regardless. Uh, and, and we, you know, we have our marketing and our books and our accounting directories shared with each other. You know, that's where we put the uh, GNU cash documents. You know, we have the, uh, the, the, the books that we share uh, with each other that we're going to go over, uh, we share that there. Uh, but then we also have the Our ComposeCast directory. Now, that's not only shared between each other, but that's actually shared publicly. So that is a, a, a public share that anyone can go into and look at and, and browse around uh, as the permissions stand right now. And that houses all the media for the Our Compose Cast episodes. Most importantly, it holds the Our Compose Cast uh, final cut episodes and the image of the, not image of the week, but like, you know, the, the episode images and, and all that, which is actually pulled down, you are correct, using that public link that I am, I just hard coded into the, the, the code that we use to generate the site, but hard-coded that, that very long, not human-readable, gibberish link, public link, into, into the code, and it goes out. And uh, what's, what's actually cool about that is since there are actually subdirectories of the Arkham Postcast folder and all of them are public, uh, I believe it's wgit that I'm using, is able to download them only a certain subdirectory from within that that entire shared directory. So it doesn't have to download the entire, let's see, how big is it right now? 10.5 gigs uh, every time that it does that. It only downloads all of the episodes and all of their associated images. So that it it's a lot slimmer than downloading everything all at once because that does include some of our other things like all of our video promos that don't go on our website, but that we retain a copy of that get after they get put up onto YouTube. So that is actually the difference between, you know, what is a, a share between people on the instance and what is a share b publicly? Public, right? sure. Now there's there's also a third type of share, which is sharing via federation. And I don't think we're gonna get, get into that today, but there How is- How do you use that? So, the way you use that is that you choose a user to be the federated user, essentially. Well, yeah, all you have to do is authenticate as, right? Uh, so you can share it. Actually, do you have to? You may not even have to authenticate. I'll, I'll have to double check that. But you do have to share it with a specific user on a specific Nextcloud instance that has federation enabled. I think it's disabled by default. So that whatever instances is, is there has to enable it. You have to enable yours. And then you have to say, share this with a specific federated user on the specific instance where it is. So like if I were to share andrewcz.com's next slide instance with, you know, jmore.com's instance, right? Yeah. I would have to share it to a specific user on your server and put that in uh, when I create that share. Uh, then you on your instance have to go in and I believe it's as an admin, you have to accept that. 
prove it yeah you have to you, not not prove anything Accept it. but yeah. you, you just have to say you just have to say yeah i i do want the share i was expecting it or i do you know al- i will allow it uh, and then once that is approved it will show up for that user on that second server and it is a it, you know anything can be accessed with the same permission granularity restrictions uh, as is on any other instance I haven't done the federated. I haven't set it up yet, but um, definitely worth noting the difference between the public and the private. Now, I don't know if you set this up on your home, on your computer or not. I have two things. I have a couple things here. So in, obviously, welcome to the podcast. We talk about uh, pictures, diagrams, there we go. graphs. But at the very bottom, there's, I, I do a couple things. At the bottom um, when of I what? First, at the bottom of the dashboard. So I guess in the files page. So it has all the files there. I get rid of, I uncheck two boxes. I think it's by default, it's show rich workspaces. I disable it. Okay. And then it shows recommendations. I also disable that one. Uh, and then I show hidden files is just, I have it left off. But if you look in the bottom there, there's something, there's a link. It's the web dev link. And this is the thing that I found the most interesting and have used the most. Uh, basically, it's based off your username. So what I've done is I have – so I do have a Manjaro instance out there. and Do you really? I, I have the uh, – yeah, I have the nice. – I have the Nextcloud Sync app. Uh, is it the Nextcloud Sync app? Yeah. It's the actual – The desktop application. The yeah. desktop application, right. So I use that for – that small workstation that don't get too excited i use it as it's a kind of like a spin up okay here's every you know here's my linux environment type thing uh most of the time i'm just sshing into it but on my i do have a mac and that's what i use as kind of my i would call daily driver fine but in the in any of these environments you can actually just use that web dev link and essentially create that I don't want to call it local. It, it's like a local link using the web dev link. So basically you're able to navigate the file. You're able to authenticate to the next cloud instance and then authenticate to, to the server that's out there. And yep. you're able to navigate those files as if they were, you know, as if it were a map similar to, I'd call it a map drive or you're basically, it's a file explorer to explore the files on the server. Not only that, but you can also so, access it if it's set up correctly, just in a regular web browser, with whatever authentication is required. Yeah. Or token or or, or whatnot. Um, because I I know I actually do the same thing inside of my Wi-Fi. Um, I have a web dev setup exposed to my guest Wi-Fi in case I want to share things with whoever's People in the area. Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's accessible. It's read only, but it's accessible. That's how it should be. I mean, yep, yep. <laughs> you'd have to be kind of crazy to <laughs> make it public. But <laughs> right, I had a couple other things out there. Honestly, those are the two important ones. I will probably have to save apps for an, another day. Oh man, uh, yeah. Because I could. I mean, I could. I could go into like calendar and the pictures app and the well. Uh, the one thing I think I will get into because it is just ready and on there by default uh, is is the stuff that you can do and view and manipulate with a stock setup. Uh, so like, for instance, Nextcloud comes with the, the photo viewer, which is, you know, it, it's, it's weird to think of it as a separate application because you're literally just browsing pictures like you would on any other image site. You know, you're just going back and through. It's a gallery. Yeah. Uh, but it's actually a separate application that it, on the back end handles that. But that's something that comes by default. So like any, yeah, so any any kind of pictures are, are ready to be viewed and gone through. Um, you know, there's there's other ones for like ebook readers. And uh, like we said, like key pass X files, you know. So there's, there's a lot you can do. Um, but by default, it at least comes with photos. And uh, I think some kind of, documentation document reader to a pdf reader i know um if if it doesn't simply use the the browser's own one so there's there's a lot that you can do by default in these uh and and while that's good i think a lot of the extensibility really does come 
from the applications. And you know, maybe that's maybe that's something I, I I take on next episode, right? And say, you know, what are what are the must-have applications because that'll make a really easy integration discussion. But I think when when you come down to it, Nextcloud's history is is that you know a couple of years ago they forked from OwnCloud, uh, which was a which started life as a Google Docs alternative replacement. And Google Docs, when it started, was pretty bare bones too. I mean, it was a Dropbox like kind of thing. So at this point, you're thinking this is literally just a remote file system for me to have. And, you know, as, as Jack's talking about, you know, their web dev integration, you know, I use it for all my calendars. Uh, there's an email client you can have in there. Um, you can share photo albums. You know, there's, there's a lot you can do. There's, there's a lot you can do. Um, at, at the core of it, though, I think the purpose for having a Nextcloud instance is that kind of centralized location to keep your important documents. Whether that's your important documents with your family, with your friends, with your church, with your tax advisor, that's it, it, it's a place for you to make sure everyone has what they need accessible to them, and and not even not even as a you know make sure you have an account sign up with the service yada yada yada. It's something you can provide to them that you know you have control over and that you know is is going to be there when you need it. Uh, I was actually thinking about this recently. I mean, Reddit got rid of their opt out option for tracking to serve advertisements. Now it's it's actually still kind of hidden there because you can go to old.reddit.com and go back to the old preferences menu and it's it's still there. But for all intents and purposes, you have no choice but to be tracked what you're doing there. Now, I'm not an extremist who would say, well, time for me to get off Reddit because they're going to track me, right? My, my thing is, well, I'm not keeping my personal conversations there. I'm not keeping my personal files on Reddit. I'm not using it. I'm not storing my daily activity on there. I'm not keeping my calendar and all my contacts and all my emails on there, right? If I was, I'd be a lot more concerned. As it is, that's a public forum that I frequent that most of what I do is going to be available to anyone who knows my username. I don't want the stuff that you know, you and I, you know, throw back and forth to each other to to be publicly indexed by someone. I I, I don't want it to be available in, in and searchable by employees of a company, right? That's that's not what I'm looking for when I'm looking for somewhere to keep my important documents. I don't I don't want my tax documents to be you know sitting on someone else's server. Yeah. I want it to be where I can securely share it with, you know, the my 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 uh tax guy. Right, whoever that ends up being. And with Nextcloud, I can do that with a lot more peace of mind than any other public service is going to give me. Right? And with our compose, I mean, that's that's why we exist as the alternative to some of these other services that are let's face it, mainly not privacy conscious they have a mainly an ad based rev revenue i mean the incentives are not aligned there and 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 as we discussed about the terms of service are changing almost day to day but but that that aside what what i'm looking for when i'm talking about next slide to someone is is really a need for i need somewhere to host my personal stuff where can i do that that is our solution when it comes to that's that's our answer that's our answer next cloud is our answer for that we already talked about it before but it's there's no limit right there's no bounds so i think the good example was you know the old beat and switch wall you sit you know google photos it's kind of harps on that well it was free all the way up until oh well guess what we hit critical mass now it's not free we know we can charge you for this so we are kind of thing um and then as another personal anecdote Last week, just a la- I think it was last week or two weeks ago, my dad blew away all his contacts on his phone 
and he, he said, yeah, make sure to take backups. <laughs> That's That was the text. That was the text. Make sure to take backups. <laughs> we were like, why? What happened? He's like, just lost all my contacts. <laughs> it's like, ooh. So he was like, I think he was able to recover up to a certain point, but just lost, lost him. It's like, well... And that's honestly where I'm going right now. After he said he lost everything, I'm pretty bad about backups, I'll admit. But I want, I need that server, that central location for me to put, you know, all my calendar information and dump all my contacts into. Just dump everything into it. And for me, you know, and I think we're probably going to have to have a calendar and contacts discussion because for me, that's a solved problem. Right, so that's that's something we I've already been able to architect away uh, over any device I would want, and from any point in the world, yeah, without without even any device I own. In the new normal, we still have to have meetings, and meetings have not gone away. I don't. They're never. They're never going to go away. I mean, meetings are just two people talking to two or more people. Where, where two or more people are gathered, there is a meeting. And I picked up this book. Well, I didn't, I didn't pick it up. It was actually uh, lent to me uh, by a guy in my community group. He's in a smaller type firm. Uh, it it's, has more of a startup culture, but is pretty well established at this point. And the... The book he lent me was "What the Heck Is EOS," and in the page here, in the in the episodes page, I do I do have it linked to actually an entire book summary, where the author actually goes through not the author of the book, but the author of the the blog post goes by chapter by chapter and kind of outlines the important parts of what's going on. So I I, I took a lot of what I have from that, but. I kind of rearranged the main points to, I, I think, fit a little bit better uh, taken out of context because the context for this is as a part of a series of books uh, for different levels of uh, responsibility within an organization. So this specific version is the like employee version uh, there is a like middle management version, and then there's like a C-suite version, uh, as I understand it, of of the series, which is called the uh, the Traction Library. So, you can do your own research, uh, see if you want to look into that or or whatnot. It, it does seem to be more so focused on a smaller uh, corporate, s- small corporate, or like startup would like to become corporate climate. But it has a, a, a couple good points that I wanted to highlight. And and I think these the, the, the points that I wanted to go over are ones that, that don't necessarily change as you balloon the size of what you have to deal with, whether it's the amount of people, the amount of servers, whatever. Uh, but but I, I think it's, it's kind of core understanding of what things have to get done. Uh, whereas a lot of the book here is prescriptive, I wanted to kind of take out those those key elements and see what why the things that were prescribed here were prescribed. So the the thing I wanted to start off with is a quote from here. It's you know why do we have to have meetings? And the and the the quote is meetings are not a waste of time. It's what you do in may- meetings that's a waste of time. And I like a good snark. But that's 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 a that's a pretty good snark. That kind of hits home for for a lot of people, you know. And you, I could almost immediately see my mind reeling. Or like, what do you mean? What I do in meetings is wrong. And I was like, I had to force myself to take a breath and say, all right, what what are we actually talking about here? Uh, now, in the in the chapter, the stated goal of where they were trying to get to here was that they wanted one meeting that eliminates all your other meetings that week. Do I necessarily believe that? I don't think so, uh, because I, th- I I think there's a lot that needs to happen around just a a, a day to day kind of how how stuff goes and and how to pick stuff up. Uh, they didn't actually have any. They may have said something about a stand up, but this isn't this isn't it. This isn't a stand up. This is like your weekly kind of 
Yeah, this is this isn't even a project meeting though. Well, it's it's actually a meeting of projects because some of the caveats uh, that I lay out here is that w- one, it's internal non-management team meetings only that they're talking about here. So it's it's basically you and the rest of your team. Whatever your team is, you know, you're all the ops guys or you're all the, you know, developer guys and but it it's not like a cross team. It's like your individual team. What should your individual team meetings look like? Which is, you know, it's it's hard to think about if if you don't have a really good standard structure for how you how you conduct a meeting, it is very easy for it to quickly devolve into a complaint session. So how, how do you avoid that? And, and why does it get there in the first place? So that you know how to avoid it. And this is, I think, trying to answer that question. Uh, the other caveat I have noted down here is that they use a couple of techniques extensively. Uh, one's called drop it down and the other's called a tangent alert. Uh, so a lot of it is uh, pushing off the weight of your discussion um, until a very segmented, a very strictly segmented amount of time. Uh, so it, it doesn't leave a lot of room for the natural kind of discussion that comes up during meetings, which is good and, and bad at the same time. Right? Um, there's, there's not a lot of natural rhythm it's it's definitely a forced rhythm but it is a rhythm i mean it you could definitely see it following a trajectory and 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 kind of flowing through the meeting and 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 how one phase kind of flows into the other there but it is strictly regimented in that it the prescription here does not allow for a lot of of tangents i mean obviously that's that's their their second caveat here where they say when people start getting off the subject and going down rabbit holes you don't have to sit there helplessly simply say tangent alert like a good little whatever to alert your team to the fact that the conversation has started to go sideways well like i said a lot of that is prescriptive right so so what what i'm about to go through is kind of relying on that this is going to be a very strictly regimented discussion and we're going to have a strict way of of doing things and it's going to go this way and we're only going to allow for a certain amount of guided discussion on a topic at the appropriate time right uh so so that's i i think what i wanted to to get the other one is is drop it down uh, which is their phrase to describe during status reports any item that is off track or anyone who has a question uh, ab- about the status report uh, that discussion gets dropped down to a later section of the meeting or a breakout session something like that yeah but but the the idea is that while they're prescribing a lot of what they do here a lot of their solutions to the problem of you know rabbit holing or, or whatnot is to simply stop it and push it off to a later date, not actually provide an ecosystem where you can have a productive off the cuff discussion. Um, now there are some that would argue, and I, I think they would hear that that idea doesn't actually exist in reality where you can't actually have a productive on the spot discussion. If someone brings up an issue, because there are too many caveats to say it could be, yeah, there, there, there there's too many scenarios where that, that productive discussion that someone thinks they're having is actually rabbit trailing down something that's irrelevant or too in the weeds for you know a, a kind of higher level status report. So having, I, I, I think finding, finding that, that balance between um, simply give me a yes or no as to whether you think you're on track with something versus uh, can you give me a little bit of explanation? Yeah, you know, what what does that little bit of explanation look like? Or are you are you just simply going to call it on a, 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 as a yes or no? I I don't think I've seen anyone who's answered a question yes or no in my life, in a professional setting. It's always been yes, but or no, except. So like there, you're always going to couch your answer somehow. So I I don't think it's it's truly honest to say you're all you can only expect a positive or negative answer when you're asking for a status report on something, because that is something very visceral to someone. It's someone who's put presumably hours and of their life into, into getting something done, you know, getting, getting that down, reducing it down to a, you know, are you on track? Are you off track? Right. That's, that's not going to, that's not going to 
resonate with anyone and, and what to do about it. Right. And, and a lot of people, I, I guess the prescription here would say, drop it down and talk about it later. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't seen that necessarily, uh, in, in actuality, I've always seen discussion in actuality, right? But that's something that you want to start minimizing. So maybe it's it's worth moving towards that. Maybe it's it's worth moving towards that without actually prescribing. You can't literally say anything about your status report. That's gonna that's gonna tick a lot of people off real quick, especially if it's it's a huge culture shift. A meeting is ultimately about communication. So you you gotta you gotta communicate what you need to communicate. So uh, the the other thing I, I I I did take away that I liked about meetings, and, the, and this is something that I naturally picked up, but it was good to to hear it in in someone else's words. Uh, but they were talking about their meeting pulse, and the the kind of summary here is that normally people are assigned tasks in your meeting, right? Sure. Uh, and then people delay taking action on those tasks until just before the next meeting. Sure. This causes, we're going to flip this around. We're not going to take this a negative way. We're going to say that this causes a spike in productivity right before the meeting. We, sure. we have some very super productive people right before the meeting. The takeaway, if you view it in, in, in that lens then, is that to the degree that you increase the meeting frequency, you can create that spike of activity, that productivity spike more often. Now, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of how often I don't you, know about that one. Well, you're you're obviously not going to have a, a, a meeting about all your projects all the time every day. Right, right, right. But if you have it once a quarter, that's probably not often enough. Too infrequent, right? Their recommendation is weekly, and I I, I can kind of get behind that. It's it's a it's a good cadence. People kind of expect that. Uh, my my fallback would be bi-weekly. I have a lot of bi-weekly meetings. Bi-weekly, yeah, bi-weekly is not bad, uh, especially Just if, if or less you can... a check-in. I wouldn't even call it a meeting in the sense it's um, more or less just get everyone on the same page. Hey, you know, well, what, and, what are you guys seeing? And it's kind and of also a lot of meeting. a lot of my touch base meetings end up being like 15 minutes. Like I don't have to take the full half hour, nor do I actually schedule the full half hour. Right. So for Zoom fatigue. I've now bought myself 15 minutes because no one else schedules 15 minute meetings. So if I go from two to two fifteen, two fifteen to two thirty, I can almost guarantee you is never ever going to be booked for me. Yeah. So I have that. I have people that take the half hour block, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just that's how Outlook divvies it up. That's how Google divvies it up. That's you know it's 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 broken up in half hour blocks. So in order to regain some of that time make your meetings a little bit shorter and not, you know, rabbit trail off. And, and, and that's ultimately the goal of the meeting here, or the, the, the chapter here. Um, but, but something I like to bring up, I actually have it on my wall right over there. I have it uh, transposed. Uh, but I wanted to, to kind of point out here why procrastination is the antithesis to productivity and, and, and how it is and, and, and really that it is because if, if you don't understand that procrastination is really antithesis to productivity, you're not going to recognize it when you see it and really understand the impact of it. Uh, there's a book called The Richest Man in Babylon uh, written 1926 and it shows um, the, the, whole, the whole book is a I don't know if it's an allegory or what, but it's it's set in ancient Babylon. And you have, you know, people with, you know, satchels of gold going around and, you know, trading donkeys and harvesting fields and, you know, the all all, all this good stuff. So so you're you're in that you're in that frame of mind and, and they're they're talking about, you know, how do you how do you deal with money. You know, what, what is money? How does money work? What, you know, money, money is weird. We haven't, you know, as humans, we haven't had money for a whole lot of time, right? We've, we've kind of done our best to, to figure out how it works and what are the laws governing money. And, and I think, I think what this book does really, really well is, is kind of put those laws as we understand them 
in terms that are approachable. And there's a there's a quote here that, like I said before, I have I have on my wall um, about productivity. And he says, "Tis not difficult to conquer once understood. No man willingly permits the thief to rob his bins of grain." Nor does any man willingly permit an enemy to drive away his customers and rob him of his profits. When once I did recognize that such acts as these my enemy was committing, with determination I conquered him, so must every man master his own spirit of procrastination before he can expect to share in the rich treasures of Babylon." So what he's what he's doing here is he's he's taking procrastination and he's equating it to an an enemy this eso, you know nebulous enemy person man dude thing driving away his customers you know robbing his his food supply right and in a very real sense that's exactly what it does because for you not planning for the future you are robbing yourself your future self from that from that benefit so if we understand that pro- procrastination right is is the antithesis to to productivity right and and we can expect all those bad things and more to happen right if we let ourselves procrastinate right we have to say is this going to be a useful tool to create a spike in productivity is this kind of meeting pulse is this is this method to to fostering productivity worth it and and i do see i do say to the degree that you increase the meeting frequency you can create that spike of activity more often but there's a whole ecosystem behind that like we we were going over the uh the what's best next chapter right uh the three things you know if someone's motivated you know what what's up you know and, and probably it's you know uh autonomy mastery or purpose Right. If if you don't have that autonomy to make your own decisions, if you you don't have that mastery over what you need to do or, or you don't have a good grasp on it or, you know, if you don't understand the bigger purpose of you doing that thing, you're most likely going to procrastinate it. Right. So so look at those three things if if you're serially procrastinating something uh, and then as an extra incentive bonus, right? If you have meetings and you, you really want to get a productivity spike, right? That's, that's a good way to kind of remind yourself. And I've, I've actually been told by my fellow coworkers, like, that's why, you know, some of these meetings that I've been holding are, are helpful because it's like, well, we're kind of holding each other accountable here. Right. I, I expect you to not procrastinate. I'm, I'm trying to protect you from that enemy. Who's going to rob your food supply. We're holding each other accountable to do that. And and this is just one of the tools in our arsenal that we can use to do that. Let's see. Got a couple more things in this, this chapter I want to go over. The most important, I think, that stuck out to me uh, is the meeting roles. To, to skip past the, uh, the rest of that. The, the meeting roles was interesting because it... It kind of ties together what you would expect to happen in a meeting. Someone, someone walks the team through the meeting. Someone leads the meeting. Right? Someone drives. Someone's driving. Right. Uh, the other thing, the other role though, was the document manager or the, the scribe, which I don't think I'd identified previously to this. Which is, you know, someone who is managing the documents that are relevant to the meeting or whatever's, whatever's going on with the meetings, you know, maintaining the list of the tasks or projects, uh, documenting, here's, here's a big one, documenting any decisions that have been agreed upon, right? I can't tell you how many times I've heard, oh yeah, you know, last month we were just talking about that and we came to this conclusion. I'm like looking at my notes. I'm like, that's, it's not what's in my notes. It's like, bro, that was that was what I understood. Well, that's uh, it's not in the documentation. <laughs> so we need to correct that. Uh, a couple other things, you know, knocking, noting down any any blocking requirements. This is especially relevant when it comes to dealing with teammates or dealing with other teams, where you you explicitly call out, hey, the reason why X isn't getting done is because I can't. 
I, I, I can't because I'm blocked because of, of someone else's requirement, right? A, 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 a dependency on, on, on someone else to complete uh, a work that, that is, is blocking me. Um, and then marking down once again, any, any kind of commitments made to accomplish tasks. Like if I, if I say, Hey, I'm going to have that done next week and then come back around and I'm like, I, what, 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 I was supposed to do something. You know, I, I don't have that leeway anymore. You know, we, we go to the, we go to the document manager. I'm like, Hey, document manager, what does it say? It says you were supposed to do this this week and have it ready by this meeting. At least then you can have a conversation around it. It's not holding someone's feet to the fire. It's like, look, you know, where, you know, where's your, uh, are, are, are you able to make the decisions you need to make? Do you have that autonomy? Uh, you know, do you understand what's going on? Do you have that mastery? You know, do you understand why this is important? Do you have that purpose? You can have that conversation at that point. That That's the thing that kicks that conversation off. You know, when, when you have those tools in your tool chest to deal with it, you say, you know, can we can we deal with the autonomy or the mastery of the purpose behind this, you know, procrastination, you know, to, to get that motivation? You know, you, you can you can you can start there, but you can't start there if you, you have no reason to have that conversation. Now, the one thing I do see in your notes here that you have the two above roles must be assumed by two different people. So that's interesting to me because you at least how we do it is the person who facilitates the meeting usually takes the notes. Yeah. And that was that was almost a throwaway line in the book. And I think I've read it probably five or six times. Like literally the, the only explanation they have here is that uh, the above roles must be assumed by two different people as it is very difficult for one person to play both roles in a meeting. And I was like, well, I wish you would have gone into why. Um, I can I can come up with a couple myself. Right. Uh, first of all, I know that it's very hard to keep the meeting moving uh, if I'm sitting there typing up notes. Right. Uh, I need to. Yeah, it's it's a lot easier to say, hey, can you make a note of that and move forward with the meeting? Right. And, and know that whoever's the note taker is is taking down what just went on so that I can. Do the same thing that he used Camboard for. I can kind of flush that conversation from my mind. I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm dumping that. I'm offloading that. Let's move forward with the next thing because we have more stuff to cover, right? And it's just a good way to, 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 to leave, that, leave that one point, solidify that one point, and move on to the next point. Uh, it, it, it's a good breakup in that. Uh, the, the second thing is, I mean, to be fair, it's really not great optics for you to be assuming all of the roles and responsibilities. It's it, it comes off very not exuberant, but you know, you know what I'm trying to say. It, it, it comes off. You're being very braggadocious. You know, it's, it's very, I'm in charge of this and this is my thing. And my notes are the official notes. And you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's not teamwork at that point. Like that's that's the antithesis of teamwork. That's that's you just saying I I'm gonna handle everything about this, right? And especially if you're a manager, I mean that that comes down to micromanaging, and then then that that has a whole lot of negative ramifications for your entire team. But even as an individual contributor, if you're someone who's clutch, you know, plays plays everything very very close to the chest, I mean that's not something that you're gonna be winning any favor from anyone else because of. Right. So, so, so the point there is that delegating that role isn't necessarily you being lazy, I would say, as the meeting facilitator. It's actually you admitting, being humble enough to admit that, hey, I, I can't do both or I, I can't do both well um, and, and I really need your help. And asking for someone's help is not the easiest thing to do. Right, you, you do actually have to humble yourself, and people will respect that when you ask for their help because you're saying, "I literally cannot do something. I am deficient. I would, I, I am actually relying on you to to help that deficiency." And people respond to that, uh, so so that that fosters goodwill in a team if if you're able to to have that that relationship with someone 
so that they can take over that really it's 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 a fairly important responsibility there uh, especially as a facilitator, you also need them to be able to bring up other things that you may need to, to look up. You, you're not going to have everything at your fingertips, right? You may be the, uh, the vision guy, especially if you're leading a particular project, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, Firefly three, everything was in your head until you, you know, you know, dumped it into the right. And in, in a spur of the moment meeting or in a weekly meeting, I mean, you, you, you don't have the ability to, to continue keeping that, documentation as well as that entire mental model intact all at one time you you need that help from someone and you need to rely on them to be there when you need it so uh, asking someone to to take on that responsibility is a huge sign of of trust in someone um, and and that's a way that you're able to gain gain trust in a team uh, is to share that responsibility because we all know it's it's very hard to to break up something that is 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 as uh, technically intense as IT. I mean, especially if you're down a rabbit hole because you have to be. It's not like someone can just jump in there with you. I mean, you're, you're spending hours getting them caught up to speed because there's just so many different intricacies, especially if it's a big project, not, you know, not just a one-off problem, right? You really need to drag someone all the way down to, to that level where they can understand it, right? And... And you can't do that without trust. So you're you're gonna have to you're gonna have to bring them on somehow, and and being able to, to have this this document manager or scribe while you're actually running the meeting, if you if you are, is is going to be helpful. Well, and and and, and at the end of the day, you're still people on a team, right? You you need to be able to, to humanize them and. Getting into the the next thing here, you know, the the meeting sections. This is this is where it got really prescriptive. Where it's like, all right, you need these seven sections, and they need to look like this. You need to go through, and I was like, okay, you know, yeah, you have to introduce some type of system, right? This is them, this is them implementing their, you know, their system. That's great. My takeaways, though, my my base takeaways were actually the intro and the conclusion. So. The, the, the intro and the segue that they had was starting on time and um, it is, is very important just uh, for, for people to level set. It's like, it's X o'clock, this starts. Like, it's three o'clock on Sundays. Jack and I are having our meeting. We're there. Or I've texted him that I'm not gonna be there, so. Um, then the next one is take the first five minutes to segue. And this, this has probably been the most helpful for me in humanizing myself and and humanizing other people to myself to 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 me uh and it's it's that transition away from the day-to-day battles that you're going through and and sharing something with the other people you're talking to like connecting with them like actually as human beings recognizing that they are fellow human beings in the same stuff that you are uh, their, their suggestion was to share good news, whether it be personal or professional. Uh, and, and that's, that's good. I like that, you know, getting, getting some positive vibes out there, starting the meeting on a good note. Um, you know, and it, you know, allows people to, to humanize each other, to get to know each other better. And, and ultimately it's, you're, you're letting them know that you care about them as a, as a human being, not just a, you know someone who gets something that gets work done because because that's a python script that's not a human uh the the other part that i came away with was the conclusion and this is especially pertinent in you know these uh these zoom times uh, where they recommend a hard stop with five minutes left to finish the necessary conclusion steps and that's so easy for people to forget except now like like teams i've noticed has like a little blip that comes up they give you a five minute warning so the recommendation from eos is is a hard stop at five minutes and uh do a couple things which is recap the to-do list uh decide the direction for follow-up outside of the team so like if you have have to have meetings with with other teams or other projects and they also have rating the meeting on a scale of one to ten 
And that was interesting. There's there's a couple bits of feedback here like that where they say, hey, make sure you rate X, Y, or Z. And it's like, why would I rate in interaction with my manager? I don't want to, you know. But but they do. They come away, you know. And they even have, like, a little criteria. They're like, well, did it start and end on time? You know, did you follow the agenda? Is everyone on the same page? You know, did you solve the most important issues? And I was like, well, I could probably give, like, in a 1 to 10 average rating on that that would be interesting um and then i mean talking about metrics that is a that is a feedback metric that you're getting from people like the second the second best metric to get after expressed preference so like or like you know actual action taken right uh i I forget i forget the term completely but like the second best metric to get after actually a observed action is going to be direct feedback aware, you know, I am asking you for feedback on these things specifically, like not trying to couch it in like, well, if you were to rate the meeting, if this meeting were to be an animal, what type of animal would it be? Dumb stuff like that. No, that that's, that sounds like the worst way to <laughs> ask for feedback. <laughs> And that's their suggestions. I mean, you could. It, it it's honestly just a number that you spit out at the end of the day. So like, what what did you feel like it? Yeah, was it an eight, a nine? You know, maybe maybe it was like a a five because it was. Nah, eh. you, you yeah. just didn't really get anything done. Just kind of yeah, beat around the bush. Maybe you know, yeah, didn't end on time. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and and maybe at the end of that, you can ask for you know more f- actionable feedback if if you have. Um, what can a, we do a better slew next time, of those. Right? Yeah, especially if you have. Why, like why a, was it a? Th- you know, it was a three. Why was it a three? Well, we went over. Okay. Well, why do we? You know. Okay. We'll work better. We'll work on that next time. All right. Well, why else was it a three? It couldn't have been just that. Well, we didn't write any of the. We didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Accomplish I mean, what we came in. We, we didn't get done what we said we were going to come in and do. Kind of one of those. So. And, w- and once again, you know, that's that's a, a jumping point off into that conversation, um, which is. That, that conversation, everyone wants to have that conversation, but no one wants to do the things that actually start that conversation. So um, I, I, I think I think that would be, those would be some interesting things. I don't know if I'm going to introduce every, everything in there, um, but those are definitely going to be in the back of my head every time we, we have a meeting. Um, specifically, the one of the criteria on the, the scale of 1 to 10, did you follow the agenda? Uh, and, and I mean, how many meetings have you been in where there's like literally no agenda and it's just people talk quite a few, quite a few. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, actually, you know what? I take that back. It's we have the agendas there. It's just it's that thing that you mentioned above that push it to it. This should be its own meeting. We have the agenda for this. We have yeah. the agenda for X yeah. and you turned it into Y. And you, it, it was kind of like a, I, I wouldn't call it a hijack, but it's kind of a hijack. It's a meeting hijack. Well, it's like, well, all right, well, our status update now turned into like a, you know, hour and 50 minute troubleshooting session, which should have ended an hour and 10 minutes ago or whatever. It's like, not only, not only is that the agenda, I mean, is, is that the precedent you're going to be setting for the following meetings or like, what is, what is the next meeting going to look like? Is, is it something that could be hijacked by literally any kind of conversation? As, as long as I speak loud enough, can I change the, co- entire agenda of this meeting like what what do i expect and then that introduced uncertainty and i i found there's a there's a great anecdote in that so like do you know why like uber became so popular no as a so like versus versus the taxi service so so if you imagine a taxi service right you you give them a call they're like yeah we'll be there in like five to 20 minutes you're like um so like can I can I have like another plate of spaghetti before I go down, or like do I need to be down there like right now? Not odd antidote, but okay. <laughs> like I don't I don't like what what is it closer to five, closer to twenty? I don't know what's going on. And what Uber found out is that people are a lot more willing to wait longer if they have an idea of how long they're actually going to be waiting. Right? right? They're they're actually completely okay with sitting there like okay it's gonna take 25 minutes that's fine i can i can entertain you know myself plate for spaghetti. Some... yeah there you go yeah yeah so and 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 not only that but if you 
under promise and over perform, people are going to be even, even happier, right? If you say 25 and you're within the acceptable margin of error, say you get there like 22 minutes, people are like, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't six minutes, right? Where, where I would literally have to wolf that down. But it's like, it's like, oh, I, I see he's getting a little bit closer and I can, I'm constantly kind of getting that kind of feedback. And you're like, that certainty makes me feel at ease. And when I walk into a meeting, when I have no clue what's going to be discussed there, I am not at ease. And there's there's no way you can you can put me there because either historically I've known that this could go off the rails or literally I'm walking into a meeting where I have no agenda. No clue what's going on, right? And it's it's up to whoever's running the meeting to kind of set the pace and 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 guide it, but they haven't even communicated that out to anyone. Exactly. Exactly. No one wants to. No one wants to get that that text and say, "Hey, in a half an hour, uh, you and me, your your boss, and my boss's boss are going to be in a meeting. I have a thirty minutes scheduled for us." You, you sit there. You you know. Are you going to do anything those other thirty minutes? You're like, oh, what ha- what what's going on? Yeah, yeah. We're looking at this implementation, and we figured you could help. You and you got. You, you it's know, like your no, no, team no. Help no, us no, out. no. Like, you, <laughs> You send me something first. You tell me that. Well, I wish I would have known, right? <laughs> right? Because I didn't get anything done for half an hour, but just worry my, you know, my head off. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You could give me just a smidge more information next time. That'd be great. But uh, so yeah, I, I I think this this next section I'm gonna keep it shorter. Um, probably not. I say that, but probably not. It's uh, it's it's actually the very next section. Uh, because we, we we're talking about you know rating your meetings and getting that kind of feedback and um, personally, you also need feedback for your own performance, not just your meetings, but you know how you how you're doing overall. Uh, chapter is called "What's My Number." It's talking about scorecards and measurables. Uh, and right off the rip, they have a great great quote here. Um, they say, "Imagine yourself playing a sport, and you can't see the scoreboard." You don't know the score. The referees will not tell you when you commit a foul or penalty. You don't know how much time is left on the clock. You're not sure if you're winning or losing. And the frustrated coach just keeps telling you, just play harder. Is that certainty? (laughs) Having just gone over that. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) It sounds almost as far as you can get from certainty. You know, there's there's obviously consequences to this, but you know, we, we we just talked for ten minutes about you know putting people at ease by you know giving them a heads up where they are, letting them level set against themselves, right? In the community, at you know, sitting at a meeting, you know, when you're on a Zoom call, you can't level set against you know how everyone's reacting to the news that you're giving. You can't, you don't know where you are, and you're uncertain. That causes you to stress out. You know, not having an idea of where you are personally or you as a team are, you know, that's going to stress you out. That's that's probably going to stress you out the most because that is the entire environment that you are in. You know, not having not having any kind of metrics, not having a, a scorecard, you know, or, you know, whatever else you want to call it, you know, is is really going to throw off everything about your, your, your day to day and your big projects. How how do you prioritize when you don't even know how long something's supposed to take to get done? You know, how how do you, how do you troubleshoot when, you know, something is just, just tossed, tossed your way, you know, and, and, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's important. Maybe it's not, you know, and, and, and that's also priority too. you know, to, to come back to, to productivity and metrics here. I mean, what, what does that end up looking like? It looks up, end up, it ends up looking like wasted time, poor resource allocation, weak overall performance, and overall terrible results. I mean, because no one knows what they are or what they're supposed to do, and they're running around the soccer field like chickens with their heads cut off. They have no idea if they're even playing soccer, right? <laughs> right. They're chickens <laughs> <laughs> with their heads for cut goodness, off. <laughs> for goodness' sake, is this even <laughs> soccer anymore? Who knows? So. You know, and and no employee wants to be a chicken, um, and it's well. There's there's a lot of things to get into metrics, but like, why why should we have this number? All right, what's 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 the big kind of overarching? Uh, obviously, we pointed out the negative absurdities to this, but th- there are a couple of reasons why 
every employee should have a number, uh, you know, to go through the list here, you know, numbers cut through the murky subjective communication between manager and employee. Someone, if a manager's kind of feeling okay about where you're heading, that's, that is not even close to where you need to be. You know, if they're, they're all cheers and smiles and you've, you've been logging, you know, days and nights and weekends and, you know, you've been, you've been working yourself to, to burn out. Do you have a metric to show that, right? Do, do you have a way to indicate that this is not a sustainable way for business to get done? And historically, it never has been. Historically, this is this is an abnormality. Do you, do you have the, the way to to say, hey, uh, I know something's been weird and I can I can show you when it started and when it started to get better, right? And you can s- sit down and say, okay, you know, is there something there that we want to make sure doesn't happen again, right? That's that's the murky subjective communication that you can get rid of or well that you can that you can improve on. Right. When when you have numbers to take a look at Um, numbers, create accountability, you know, just like notes in a meeting, creating accountability numbers saying, hey, you said you're going to hit this. You didn't hit this. No one's no one's blaming. There's a difference between being accountable and blaming someone. It's it's almost like an apology. A really good apology doesn't make an excuse. A really good apology just says, hey, you know what? I acknowledge that, you know, I said I was going to do this or, you know, I, I did this uh, and there was repercussions and consequences that affected you. And, uh, you know, I'm doing my best. Uh, here's here's why this will not happen again and steps I'm taking to to assure that. Like a really good apology will go through that, but you have to acknowledge that something went wrong. If you don't acknowledge that something went wrong, you can't make that kind of apology and get past that point. You're still going to have that, you know, that it's it's not going to be accountability. It's going to be this murky situation where there's no trust. There's no trust. There's no level set. There's there's no goodwill. You 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 get you get people holding grudges for stuff that should have been apologized for. In the past but are unable to because that conversation never had the opportunity to never up. happened right yeah yeah so numbers create accountability numbers and, and accountable people appreciate numbers too people who want to to genuinely have that genuine need to apologize appreciate the jumping off point to have that conversation you know or or people who are doing really well will appreciate someone else acknowledging that right saying hey you know what your numbers are actually through the roof you know over the last you know so 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 often you know is is there something that's been doing really well can can you help out other people you know how can how can we help you maintain this or 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 help the rest of the team with this and and those those accountable people will will like that because it it helps them They'll, they'll appreciate that numbers like we were saying they create clarity and commitment uh, numbers create competition, which can be healthy. Um, sure. it, it can also numbers can also be held privately. This is not something that is necessarily have to be shared out. Now that's a implementation detail that you're gonna have to figure out. How do you want your metrics to be viewed, right? Because obviously you don't want to share everyone's failings with everyone else. That's that may actually create a, a blame culture, and that's not good. So how 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 do you how do you make that decision on on what can we be competitive about what what can't we? Um, numbers produce results, point blank. I mean you you got to measure results somehow. Uh, right. Numbers are the easiest way to cut through the fluff there. Uh, numbers also create teamwork. Uh, one of one of the numbers I'm looking at implementing soon is the number of uh, times someone has been able to review someone else's work to to like like peer review right yeah because that's that's one of the things that often gets overlooked in the life cycle it's like well what about the dude who reviews everyone else's stuff right who, who looks over it catches the little things right he's not the the superstar who finished the project for the team you know he didn't he didn't fix the you know the the, the p1 you know he wasn't he wasn't the the star right but he didn't cause the p1 either <laughs> Right. Exactly. And and that's one of the things that, that that I would hope would foster teamwork. Right. Because if you have people who are able to, you know, accountable people are getting recognized by them contributing to the team in a very often overlooked area. Uh, that's something that they should appreciate. You know, it it should be something that they're able to appreciate. Um, 
and their last point here is that numbers solve problems faster, which is, is kind of the culmination of, of everything that we just talked about. To round this out with a little bit of prescription, because I, I, I can't walk away with simply ideals, right? With, with just kind of esoteric, this, this sounds good on, you know, on, on paper, you know, but, sure. but how's it going to look where I do things in right? practice? Right. Um, one of the things that they were really excited about pointing out over and over again uh, in this, this chapter was the amount of metrics that you want to cover, you know, and whether you call that, you know, your, your dashboard or your KPIs or your store scorecards or, or what have you, right. How many of those do you actually want to track and a company level, maybe like five to 15, right. If you're, you're thinking big picture, but, Team to team, you want about three to five metrics. Anything more is too fluffy. Anything less isn't going to get you enough. So, and and I can agree with that, right? Where that becomes interesting is when they say that the individual and the department metrics should have the same measurables reported on. In that the department metrics, the the, the metrics that are measured at a department level, like our entire team closed this many tickets, right? They should simply be the aggregate of the individuals that comprise it. So, like individually, all my you, you had the reports, you had the metrics for for all the people on the team showing how many that they closed, and and those metrics are rolled up into the departments, and you're going to see that in every single metric that the department has, whether it's you know pull requests or time cards or, you know, reviews like we were talking about or, or literally any of the other things, right? You, you want to make sure that you're matching what your team is producing. So even if, and, and here's where you get to, to start looking into what do I expose publicly, right? If you say, well, as a team, we've closed this so many, this many incidents, right? You can you can say back to yourself, all right. Well, I'm on a you know I'm on a five person team, and uh, I know that personally when I saw that that latest metric, um, I had one tenth of that. So, either someone just got a whole slew of really easy tickets, right? Or I need to step up to the plate and right. take some some things off my teammates, and it's never going to be. It's never going to be the same across the board, right? And that's that's where you have the the management level who can you can kind of stand back and say, all right, well, you know what, you're you you've actually got other metrics and other things going on, and and not other murky subjec- sub- subjective things going on, like actual number things going on. You know, you've you've got other numbers other places that are important. This number right here that maybe you weren't you weren't proportional on is something that is okay because we've got, we've got a team. Like that's a cool thing about the team. We can pick up each other slack, right? But you don't know who's picking up which slack until you're able to put these numbers around it. Uh, and then, like I said, if you're able to roll it up into the department, you can, you can almost get that transparency without ever having to call anyone out in a public setting, which is, it's never going to be a good time. And the only other thing, I'm talking about trends here. Uh, they do recommend a 13-week lead time for data, uh, which is like 90 days-ish. So you you, you want to take a look back. You, you, you always want to have a good backlog of, of information to to look against. I mean, if, if you need to have that conversation, right, if you need to, to say, well, look, we something happened at this point. Because I can see we're we're kind of we're, we're we're floating along. Yeah, we're we're you know floating along, and then then we started going way downhill. What happened? You know, are we okay? Is everything okay? Can I can I help? Do you <laughs> coming back to it? You know, do you have that autonomy? Right? Do you have that mastery? Do you have that purpose? These numbers are a way to start having those conversations to say how can I help? Right? These numbers are not bad person you're not good enough to hit you with a stick right this is a hey you're not asking me for help but i'm seeing that 
that by in you're not asking me for help verbally, but there are other ways that you're indicating that you need some help, and I'm here to help you either as a teammate, you know, or or, or if you're in management position, right? That's where you can start sit down and have that conversation. Hey, it looks like you need some help, right? I I want to offer my help in these specific ways, and we can talk about how to ask for help later, but or how to offer help, but. These these are, are such a good way to, to springboard to have those conversations, you know, because there's there's a lot that that comes into play when, when you're when you're just working with other people, like they're they're humans too, right? They they have the same they have the same fears, they have the same, you know, uh, 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 shortcomings, they have the same pride, right? That 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 you do in 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 everything that you do you know that you're you're working you're working with people right and if 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 you're listening to this there's a chance that you know someone who needs to hear this who needs to know that they're not alone that there there's there's similar struggles that we all that we all face right we the they, they need to hear that we're all humans behind the screen, right? So make sure to go ahead and share this episode with them so we can bring them into these discussions to have these same discussions on, on what does productivity mean? You know, what, what can we do with open source software? You know, what, what are these really cool things where we can start making these, we can start making people's lives better. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.